Hey, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We are looking for more videos of viewers like you playing your shofar to put the opening and closing of our lessons. If you would like to submit a video, talk to your parents. There will be a link to a drive folder in the description below that you can upload to, or you can email them to us, trainedupintorah at gmail.com, or contact us on Facebook. All right, let's get going with this week's lesson. Shalom. Hey, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. It's a nice day today, and I hardly ever leave the bus, so I thought I'd take y'all outside today. So we might have some roosters crowing or cats meowing or cars going by. So I hope that isn't too noisy so that you can't hear me. So today we're going to be reading about some activities that happen on a very specific day. On this day, something big happens and it happens every year. A lot of people think of this as the most special day of the year. And so we're going to read this chapter and see if you can figure out why some people would think it's the most special day of the year. So let's go read about it. Now, just to remind you, because it's been a little while since the last time we had a lesson, we had recently had where Aaron and his sons were being ordained to be the priest. And Aaron's sons brought in some strange kind of incense, some strange fire before Yahweh that they weren't supposed to do. And they died because of what they did. Now, I didn't catch it until today, because right now my family's keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread. and. During the Feast of Tabernacles, we read the whole book of Deuteronomy. And last year we started, we read the whole book of Exodus during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we were reading the other day and it was way back in Exodus, but it was when Yahweh was telling Moshe on the mountain all about all these different things, all these rules, the Ten Commandments. And he told some very, very important things about the priest, including their clothes, the way the tabernacle was gonna look, what kind of materials they would need way back then so that's a long time ago before they actually started building it and it stuck out to me and i had not noticed it before for some reason i just thought that aaron's sons had done this thing they, they were not commanded to do but there was actually a command in exodus where yahweh says for them not to bring strange incense before him so yahweh actually commanded not to bring any kind of strange incense now i don't really know what that means I don't know if y'all know what that means, but it was something they weren't supposed to do. It wasn't, I guess, supposed to be different than what Yahweh actually wanted them to do. And so in Exodus 30, verse nine, Yahweh says, do not offer strange incense on it or a burnt offering or a grain offering and do not pour a drink offering on it. So way back then, which we might have, dis I did, disconnected that because that's way back in Exodus. Now we're in Leviticus, I disconnected there was a command not to bring strange incense. It wasn't just that his sons did something they weren't commanded to do. They broke a straight commandment. So that's what we're picking up at. And also something else I noticed, and I want you to know this for what we're going to read today. It was talking about Aaron's clothes, the curtains for the tabernacles, all those things way back in Exodus. And one of the things that I thought was interesting, I think it was yesterday we read it. It was talking about Aaron's clothes that he was to have on the bottom of his clothes a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. And it would go all the way around the hem of his garment so that when he goes into a set apart place one time a year, that's what we're about to read just so you know, he, it would be heard that he was going in and coming out. And that had to happen so he wouldn't get killed. Now, I don't know why, but there was something important. Yahweh wanted him to be heard when he came in before Yahweh, because Yahweh was in the dwelling place, the most important part of the dwelling place. And that's where he was going to go in one time a year. And it had to be that he was heard or he would die. So today, as we're reading, think about Aaron going in and little bells tingling as he walks. Okay. All right. Let's get going with our scripture story. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malhuto Leolam Yeah, 
Shabbat Shalom! Shabbat Shalom, friends! It's so good to be back with you today. Well, before we start, why don't we open up in prayer? Bow your heads with me. Dear Yahweh, thank you for this beautiful Shabbat. I pray blessings over all of our watchers and all of our teachers today. Help us to learn something new today. In your holy and gracious name, Amen. Well, today I have a hymn for you, and it is called A Blessing in Prayer. I hope you like it. Hi everyone, this is Carrie. Today we will be looking at Leviticus chapter 16. Yahweh spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before Yahweh and died. And Yahweh said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before Yahweh at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for Yahweh, and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself, and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. And he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before Yahweh, and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small, 
and he shall bring it inside the veil, and put the incense on the fire before Yahweh, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting, which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before Yahweh and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all the iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall bathe his body in water in a holy place and put on his garments and come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. And he who lets the goat go to Azazel shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. And the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burned up with fire. And he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. And it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before Yahweh from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement wearing the holy linen garments. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute forever for you that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And Aaron did as Yahweh commanded Moses. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Today for our nature lesson, we're going on an amazing adventure inside our bodies to discover the incredible world of blood. Meet our two special friends, red blood cell and white blood cell. Hi there everyone, I am red blood cell and I am all about carrying oxygen to every part of the body. And I'm white blood cell, ready to defend our body against germs and invaders. Fantastic! Now let's learn about blood and its important job in our bodies. Our adventure begins at the heart, the incredible pump that keeps everything moving. I'm the heart, and I pump blood to every part of the body. I've got a special task for red and white here. 
as red and white travel through the blood vessels, they pass through the lungs, where red picks up fresh oxygen, and then they speed through the body, delivering oxygen and fighting off any invaders. I carry oxygen. I'm like a tiny delivery truck taking oxygen to every cell in the body. And I'm the defeater. I fight off germs and keep our body safe and healthy. Red and white work together to keep our bodies healthy and strong. They make sure every part of our body gets what it needs. So blood and the circulatory system are what keep us alive. Our bodies are amazing because Yahweh made them that way, and we need to be sure to take good care of them. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. So what did you think about our scripture reading today? There was a lot that went on in there. A lot of details if you start breaking it down. And I'm not going to talk about all of it today. And actually, we have a special lesson just to talk about this day, the Day of Atonement. It's called our Yom Kippur special. So you can go check out that special if you want to and find out about all the verses just about that talk about the Day of Atonement throughout scripture. So that'll give a little bit more insight into this day. But for right now, we'll just talk about some of the stuff just mentioned in this chapter. So one, I think it's really, really cool that Yahweh has allowed every single year a way for us to be forgiven for our sins. So that we can know that if you sin and you find out that you're sinning, it's not just you're forever gonna be a bad person and you're not gonna make it to Yahweh's kingdom. He offers a way for us to say, hey, I did something I was supposed to do and repent from it and turn from it and us to be forgiven. Every single year, there's a special day where the high priest would go in and do an offering for all of Israel. So it wasn't even that you did the offering for you. It was the priest was doing it for everybody. And yes, we have to do our part and ask for forgiveness and turn from our sin. But you always still put it in that every year on this special day, the priest would be forgiven. He would have to do an offering for himself and his family. And then he would do it for Israel too. So I thought that was pretty cool and a very loving Elohim that we have to take care of us and provide a way for us to be forgiven and to be back at oneness with him. If you spell out atonement, at one, so we're back at one with him. We've been forgiven and washed clean and back in good stance with him. So I thought that was pretty cool. So we had the two goats today. We had the one goat that's for Yahweh that gets offered. And then we had the one that was the Azazel goat. And all of the sins get confessed on his head and he's took away into the wilderness by a strong or a fit man. And that might sound a little crazy, doesn't it? Well, Yahweh's pretty cool. And he has patterns throughout everything. Nature has patterns. All of his word has patterns. There's patterns everywhere and he puts meaning into all of it. And we may never understand a lot of it, but there are some things that we can look at and say, hey, that matches this and that matches that. Like, you'll notice the number seven is pretty important in scripture. We saw seven today. There's seven times that he sprinkles the blood. Do you know of anything else that is in scripture that talks about a seven? What about the seventh day Sabbath? That's a seven. What about the land Sabbath that happens every seven years? That's a seven. What about the year of Jubilee that happens after there's seven land Sabbaths? What about how many days there are during the Feast of Unleavened Bread? There are seven days. What about how many days there are in the Feast of Tabernacles? There are seven days. So remember, Passover is one festival, and then seven days for Unleavened Bread, and then at the end of the year, we have seven days for Tabernacles, or Sukkot, and then there's a closing festival. So you've got seven and one, so you got eight together, but there's seven. So there's lots of sevens. So, what does seven mean to Yahweh? Not sure. We have some ideas that we can think of, but we're not 100% sure. But there's patterns. And a lot of people have guesses at what they think the Azazel goat represents and what the other goat represents. Now, it doesn't tell us this in scripture. So this is something for you and your parents to talk about and see what you think. 
some people believe that the one that gets offered represents Yahshua and that all the sins, you know, he, he would be sacrificed for our sins. And then they believe that the Azazel goat represents Satan and that all the sins are confessed on his head because, you know, Satan kind of is part of all the sins that go along in the world. And then he's took off into the wilderness and that's represent him being cast away. And then some people believe it's the other way around. So I don't really know what the meaning is or what Yahweh is using that to represent, but there's a lot of details put into it. And I have a feeling Yahweh means it to represent something. What do you think it represents? It'd be a good thing to study and talk about with your family, wouldn't it? So this day is a day to cleanse us, to cleanse all of Israel from their sins. And it's almost like it's cooties, all the bad stuff, because everybody that dealt with the goats or they dealt with the offerings, they had to come and wash afterwards and change their clothes and get all the yucky stuff away from them, didn't they? So it's a picture all around of all of the bad, yucky, sinful things that we have in life being washed away and us being cleansed. Now, multiple times in this chapter, it said something, something really important. Did you catch it? You know what it said? It said it was a law for tomorrow. Is that what it said? To say it was a law for yesterday. Is that what it said? A law forever. Do you know how long forever is? It's a really long time. So this is a law forever. That we're supposed to keep the Day of Atonement. Now it says that you are to afflict your being. And there's some different understandings of what that means. We go into that more on the special, but no matter what your understanding for affliction is, something that I tell my kids for the Day of Atonement, why it might be that we are to afflict our beings is to afflict your being is to make you feel bad. So we are to make ourselves feel bad. And that's a way to show Yahweh that we feel bad for all the bad things that we've done. So it may be uncomfortable when you do the Day of Atonement, no matter what way you're used to afflict your being. But it's really for a good reason, is to show Yahweh we feel bad and we're sorry for all the bad things that we've done. And then when we've done this law that's forever throughout our generations, Yahweh is faithful and he will forgive us and wash us clean of our sins. So that's pretty cool. So did you notice that it's only the high priest that can do this on the Day of Atonement? He's the only one that can go into the most set apart place. He's the only one that can do this. And do you know who our high priest is now? It's Yeshua. Do you know that? He is our high priest in the heavenly kingdom. Do you remember that when Moshe was getting the instructions of how to build the tabernacle and all of the details, that it was shown to him what it looked like in the heavens and that that is what he was making a copy of. So there was already a tabernacle where Yahweh dwells and that was being copied and put on earth. And so now Yeshua is up there as our high priest. So I'm gonna read to you Hebrews 2 verse 17. So in every way he had to be made like his brothers. I'm talking about when he was born as man on earth. In order to become a compassionate and trustworthy high priest in matters related to Elohim to make atonement for the sins of the people. So he came and lived on earth just like us and lived just as a normal person. He had to feel pain. Did you know Yeshua cried? There's many times that Yeshua was moved to cry. He had to feel anger and happiness and love. He had to go through things just like us. And that makes it where he can be compassionate and trustworthy and know what we're going through. Okay, so I'm gonna read another verse. Hebrews 4.14 Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua, the son of Elohim, let us hold fast our confession. And then the next verse 15. For we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tried in all aspects as we are apart from sin. So he was tried in every way and he has compassion for us. He understands what we've been through and what we're going through. Okay, so another verse, I think this is interesting. It is Hebrews 5.5. 5. So also the Messiah did not extol himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, 
You are my son today. I have brought you forth. So Yeshua didn't say, hey, I want to be high priest. Yahweh is the one that said, hey, you're going to be the high priest. And then in verse 10, it says, having been designated by Elohim a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Do you remember Melchizedek? We read about Melchizedek a while back in Genesis. Abraham gave a tenth of his spoils that he got when he went to save Lot to the priest of Melchizedek. So you can go check out that story again if you've forgotten it. It's an interesting story too. Then I'll end this segment right here with this verse, Hebrews 7, 26 and 27. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, kind, innocent, undefiled, having been separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need as those high priests to offer up slaughter offerings day by day, first for his own sins and then those of the people. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. So we have an awesome Father in heaven who loves us and makes a way for us to be at one with him. And then we have a loving brother who offered up himself to take that place for us to cover that offering and to be the high priest for us. All right, well, let's get going the rest of our lesson and I'll see you back in just a few minutes. Shabbat Shalom Alechem Yeladim Banim Uvanot Shemi Asher Vehayom Anachnu Nilmad Kesat Milim Al Yom Hakipurim Yom Hakipurim Hu Ehad Mim Moade Yahweh Yom Hakipurim Yom Hakipurim Beyom Hakipurim אנחנו נזכור אשר ישוע משיחנו מת לכפר על עוונותינו. כיפר, כיפר. הנה כהן גדול, יש בישראל כהנים רבים, והכהן הגדול הוא ראש. כל הכהנים, כהן גדול, כהן גדול. ביום הכיפורים הכהן הגדול יעשה עבודה. ולקח שני שעירים, שעיר, שעיר. ונתן הכהן הגדול גורלות על השעירים. גורל, גורל. ויהי אחד השעירים לשעיר ליהוה. שעיר ליהוה. שעיר ליהוה. ושחט הכהן הגדול את השעיר הזה לחטאת. חטאת. חטאת. ולקח הכהן הגדול את השעיר האחר, ושמח את ידיו על ראש השעיר, 
והתוודה עליו את כל עוונות העם. התוודה. התוודה. ושלח הכהן הגדול את השעיר הזה, המדברה. שלח. שלח. השעיר הזה יישא את עוונות העם אל המדבר. מדבר. מדבר. השעיר הזה נקרא שעיר לעזאזל. שעיר לעזאזל. שעיר לעזאזל. וזה סוף הדבר. להתראות! Shabbat Shalom everyone, my name is Ms. Saraya and it's time for our history lesson. Today we read in Leviticus 16.4 He should put on the set-apart linen long shirt with linen trousers on his flesh and gird himself with a linen girdle and be dressed with a linen turban. They are set-apart garments and he shall bathe his body in water and shall put them on. You might be thinking, why is he wearing trousers? Trousers are like pants. Don't the Bible characters always wear dresses? Well, they did wear robes. Um, they also wore trousers. There are several verses in scripture talking about trousers. A lot of them are talking about the priestly garments. But we are also told that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had trousers. So we do know that Israelites wore trousers. At first, trousers were worn by the military, and later on, the common people began wearing them as well. Men and women in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia wore trousers. They would wear robes, but they also wore trousers. Sometimes they would wear trousers under their robe, and sometimes they would wear trousers with a shirt. The Greeks liked their big, flowy dress togas, and they thought that trousers looked ridiculous. They thought that they looked like the clothes that wild barbarians would wear. Not anything they would, they were too civilized. The Greeks nicknamed them sacks. As like a kind of talking bad about it. It's, it's, a, it's a sack, it's not worth wearing. The Romans agreed with the Greeks. They liked the big flowy dress-like things and they thought that the trousers were ridiculous. They also thought that trousers were a sissy thing to wear and that their dress-like things were manly. But later, the Romans actually began to wear trousers because as the empire got bigger and grew and expanded, they got in colder places and they realized that trousers were good for that. The trousers were warmer than their robes and so they actually started wearing trousers. Now there was two kinds they would wear. One was looser and it went down to the ankle and it normally tied with a drawstring around the waist. The second one wasn't quite as loose and it normally ended around the knee. They got both of these pants from the Celtic people, the Irish, the Scottish. And it might surprise you because the first thing that you normally think of when you think of Irish and Scottish are kilts. So you don't normally think of trousers. But actually, kilts weren't a thing yet. They did wear robes and they wore trousers, but they didn't have the kilt at this time. That didn't come around until later. In the late 14th century, trousers started to become more like leggings. They might have feet like a stocking or they might have a band under the foot to hold the legging down to your foot so it wouldn't slide up. And that's what knights would wear under their armor. In the 1500s, trousers kind of got a little bit exaggerated. They were big and poofy. They might even stuff them with pillows to make them extra poofy. 
And they would have slits down the leg to show the inside lining. Like there would be two layers of fabric and they would cut this one so you could see the other one. And the inside one would normally be colorful. Now the 16th century is when we get kilts. The word kilt means to gird oneself. Previously, we've had a history lesson about girding where we explained what that is, but basically it was a way to pull up your skirts and tie them to your belt to get them out of the way so that you could move around better and do work. So with the kilt, you're basically doing the same thing. You're making your robe where it's not blocking your legs, you can move around better. But instead of all the girding, they just chopped off the bottom and had the kilt. A little later, pants went down some as far as poofiness. And it was common then to have pants a little below the knee with stockings and they were better fitting, not these gigantic balloon pants. And they were called breeches or britches. That's like the kind of pants that colonial Americans would be wearing. And after that, we got trousers more like we know today. I hope you had fun and learned something new. Shabbat Shalom. This ought to be the right place. Ah, the Day of Atonement. I think that means what I need to do for my sin. Okay. Okay, so what I need is a bullock, two goats, and a ram. I know two goats in a room, but wait, what's a bullock? I suppose I should ask Andrew, because he knows these things, and I don't. Andrew! Hey, Andrew! Yes, Jordan? I have a question for you. Oh, could it be of a scientific nature? Um, I don't know, maybe. Uh, what is a bullock? Ah, a bullock is a male member of the bovine species. Oh, uh, what's that? It's a male cow. Oh, so like the male man on uh, the no, cow? No, 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 no. It, male as in boy. Oh, so it's a boy cow. I see. Precisely. Now, why do you want to know? Uh, because I was reading the Bible about the Day of Atonement, and it mentioned a bullock, and I was confused. Oh, I see. Ah, the Day of Atonement. The day of a solemn assembly of remembering our sins and the atonement that covers us. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, when you sin and, like, you lie or something and it's covered up. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hmm. So now I need a bullock. Hmm. I don't know any cows. Hey, you, Dolly. Oh, you might work. What? Hi, Jackie. <laughs> Could you help me out with something later, please? Sure. Uh, what do you want help with? Don't ask questions. Okay, let's see. Now, and Aaron shall cast Lot. Oh, Lot. Like the Bible character. Hmm, what could I use for Lot? Oh, hey, Mr. Pookie. Do you like Lot, the Bible character? Oh, so do you want to help me out later on or something? Okay, thank you. Bye. Now I need the goats. Goat brothers. And, uh, oh, Mr. Pookie. Oh, I mean, lot. All right. Okay. Cast lot. All right, it's dinner. Okay. No one that fell. Should be alright, and the other one should be a scapegoat. So, can you do that, please? Because I don't know what that means. Oh, what's going on here? You're a deli. Shh, 
I'm reading the scriptures. Your part's coming soon. <clears throat> Let's see. And you shall kill them! Hold on, wait. What? Kelly, can't you see you're doing a few things wrong here? Um... What? This is not the Day of Atonement. Two, you are not a priest. Three, this is not the tabernacle or the temple. And four, I am not a cow! Why are you even doing this? Oh, well, I did something bad. I lied to mommy. Oh, why didn't you tell anybody? Well, I couldn't let anyone know I did something bad. I wanted to fix it myself. Dear Dolly, atonement isn't about covering up what you did so no one knows about it. That's like lying, which is a sin. Atoma is about admitting your sins to Yah and letting him cover it up. But I thought covering up was like lying. No, uh, no, 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 no. Yah doesn't lie. Whatever he says is true. So it's different when he covers up our sins. And if he says we're forgiven, we're forgiven. So, atonement is like forgiveness? Kinda. Only the kind of forgiveness Yah gives us is special. You see, Hebrews says that even the bulls and goats and Day of Atonement sacrifices couldn't take away our sins. They're sort of a remembrance of sins to remind us to be sorry. But Yeshua can take away our sins. Oh, well, that's good because I don't like my sins. Uh, that's good because Yah doesn't like them either. Which is why after he gets rid of our sins, we need to try not to sin again. Yeah. How do I get forgiveness? Well, you should say sorry to Ya, just like you should maybe say sorry to Mom. Yeah, maybe I should do that. Thanks! Mm, mommy? Yes, dear Dolly? I have a confession to make. What is it? That sound you heard earlier that I said was nothing was really the little blue birdie falling off the shelf and breaking. Oh, so mm. that's what happened to it. Mm. I'm sorry I didn't tell you immediately and I tried to cover it up. Oh, I forgive you. Thank you for telling me and letting me know. You're welcome. I love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye. We were lost and scattered far. We didn't know who you are or who we were living in sin. There was no
Are you learning a lot? I hope you are. While the fun's not over, we have a little bit more, but before we do that, I just wanna give a quick reminder. We have the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur special, so you can go check that out for more if you wanna learn more about the Day of Atonement. And I saw this other verse just a minute ago, and I wanted to share this too. So it's in Hebrews also, starting in verse 11. But Messiah, having become a high priest of the coming good matters, through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Remember what I was talking about a little while ago about the tabernacle, the tent, that that was a copy of what was in the heavens? Well, isn't that cool? That Messiah, that he is a high priest of a greater and more perfect tent that's not made with hands. I wonder how that tent got made. What do you think? How do you think it was made? Well, let's read the next verse. So, so having become a high priest, he entered into the most set apart place once for all, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, having obtained everlasting redemption. So I think that is a great place to leave and I will see you next time. You still have a little bit more fun for the lesson's over, but that's all with me for right now. So Shabbat Shalom, have a blessed week.
Nothing but the blood of Yeshua. Shabbat Shalom, Miss Jessica here with this week's memory verse. Now, as we've been going through scripture, we've learned lots and lots of rules and things that Yah wants us to do. Some of these things we've learned now with science, the reasons why Yah gave us these commands. But many things we simply have to trust and know that our Elohim has given us these commands for a good reason. Much like the commands given in today's scripture story. He gave all those instructions for a good reason. As we go throughout our week that's coming up, let's try our best to listen and obey Yah in everything we do. One thing I really enjoy doing with verses that I'm working on sometimes is to make them into a little song or what I like to call a little ditty. So here is what I came up with for this week's memory verse. I hope you enjoy it and I hope that it makes this verse super easy to remember and that you can always recall it at a moment's need. Deuteronomy 13.4 Walk after Yahweh your Elohim and fear him and guard his commands and obey his voice and serve him and cling to him. Feel free to practice this as many times as you need to help you memorize it. And if singing is not your thing, feel free to copy it. Do whatever helps you memorize your verses. Well, I pray that everyone has a blessed Shabbat and a wonderful week. Shabbat Shalom. Hey you guys, Shabbat Shalom. While reading Leviticus 16 today, verse 12 stuck out. It talked about a fire holder and I thought it'd be really cool to make a cup to hold our snack today. Would you guys like to do that? All you'll need for today's project is a piece of construction paper and some scissors. So grab some paper and let's get started.
Hey everybody. So we did have a snack for this week's lesson, but at the last minute I thought about it's the day of atonement lesson and most people afflict their being by fasting. So I decided it was probably better to skip on the snack this week. All right, we'll see you next time. Shabbat Shalom. Please join me in prayer. Dear Yahweh, thank you for this peaceful Shabbat and for bringing us here to read your word. Thank you for helping Kaylee put together this video. Please help everyone this week to get us back to your day. In Yeshua HaMashiach's name, Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Mm hmm.